Um, I have a couple of special um, things I want to do real quick, and that is we want to have prayer for Brother Harry Hines, uh, Harry and Judy. They're normally always right here, sit over to, to the left, but Harry's mother passed um, about two weeks ago, and uh, his father was a pastor in Brooklyn, New York, of about 2,500 people. And um, if I'm understanding him correctly, since his mother had passed, she was like 91. Um, his father had resigned and come down to be with Harry and Judy and started having some headaches and uh, couldn't seem to shake it, went to the, the doctor, ended up at the ER, and then back at the ER. But he's in ICU right now. Heart rate is like over 200. Uh, can we just stand together and have prayer uh, for Brother Harry Hines' father? And, and uh, as well for his sister and, and the whole family, uh, Harry and Judy, some of the nicest people you ever meet. They're always here. They're always serving. But let's just bow in prayer for them. Father, we just come to you, Lord, for Harry's father. Right now in ICU, Lord, speak to that heart, God. I know that you're able to touch him and minister to him right now. Lord, for that sister, Lord, uh, the entire family, God, and even for the church, Lord, that, uh, that, that has to press on. I pray, God, that you would just minister right now. God, speak a word of healing, and he shall be healed in Jesus' name. I thank you for what you're going to do in the name of the Lord. Amen. And amen. You may be seated if you can. One more, and I don't know if she's in this service or will be next service. I see Brother Pete back there. I don't know, uh, um, I had a note that maybe Miss Elise was going to be with us, not able to make it. Well, anyway, um, Pete's mother, Miss Elise, has been with us years ago at the old church, and I remember her singing and playing the piano occasionally, and she's at the Convalescent Center in uh, St. Mary's, and they told me that's all she talks about is to be able to come uh, to the harbor or come here to the church. And um, anyway, we're so excited. I talked to Brother Pete, and I, I really hope he don't mind me sharing this. In fact, I shared with the count, not the council, but the staff just a moment ago. Brother Pete saw me in Stephens just a few days ago last week, and uh, he's always been cordial, had a smile on his face. And we walked in, and he walked out, and he come back, and he said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. You guys have prayer for me. I think it might have been the night of worship. He said, but I ain't drank a drop of liquor in over two months. He might have said three. I can't remember. Matter of fact, I got a picture right here of him and me. Just I was just uh, taken by that. And he said, not only that, you need to understand how I did it. I ain't talking about just weekend. He said, I started at 9 o'clock in the morning and drank till 1030 at night. He said, but I could function and I could carry, and, and hey, I, 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 my dad's here with me today, and he's got a brother. I, I remember my uncle could do that. He, he was just a functioning alcoholic. He'd go to work, man. It just, and, uh, but hey, God is still a deliverer. God is still a deliverer. And so I thank God. Thank God, Brother Pete. Thank you for uh, sharing that testimony with me. And today I want to take you, and, and I'm so glad to have my dad with me. He's going to be here uh, all the way through the 5th, uh, so the kids' Christmas play. And so uh, I'm delighted that he's uh, with us right now, and uh, we're going to have a great time together. But we're in the book of James, and we're in chapter 2 uh, right now, and I, I want to share a message with you entitled, Living Out the Word. Because how many of you know it's, it's more important to live out something than just to say something? Now, I don't want you to look at anybody in particular, but have you ever known someone who always talked about how they were going to do this, they were going to do that, they were going to go back to school, they were going to lose 100 pounds, they were going to build this, buy that, they were going to do this, and all these years passed by and they hadn't done squat. Again, just look at me. Don't look at anybody else. You get in trouble with that. But I, here's what you got to know. It's so important for you to know that genuine Christians, those who've been saved, those who've washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, they live out the Christian life. They don't just talk about it. They live it out. Yesterday was one of the greatest examples of the church. And again, you are the church. The church was in the communities of Camden and Charlton yesterday. And so we as a church were living out what we say. 
We say we love people. We showed we love people. I went the extra mile. I had someone call me, an evangelist called me, or messaged me last night, said, can I get one of them boxes? I said, well, they're all gone, but we'll sponsor your Thanksgiving dinner if you need it. Amen? Living it out. Say it. And I remember standing over in the folks in Church of God, and I asked our team, and by the way, I'm telling you, Eddie and Wendy, I'm not sure if they're in this service or next or whatever, but they did a splendid job of, of organizing this. But there was like 80-something people in line you know, at, out the gate, I mean, 30 minutes beforehand. And I was thinking ahead of thinking, Lord, we don't want to run out of turkeys and boxes. We need to know that a block away from the distribution site. We don't need to wait till they get here. And I told Pastor, I said, because if we get right here and we don't have one, we're fixing to go over there and buy them ourselves because uh, we can't turn somebody away like that. Anyway, thank God we come right down to the number in Folkestone, and uh, I believe we did pretty much in Camden as well. But, but genuine Christians live out their faith. James starts off chapter 2 with a warning against <clears throat> prejudice and favoritism. Now, I don't have to tell you what prejudice is or favoritism, although I might before it's over. In Acts chapter 10, Peter says, I see clearly that God shows no favoritism. Have you ever seen a teacher's pet? My wife was one. The teacher was Miss Tanner. We were in fifth grade. And if the teacher ever said, <coughs> Kelly said, I have a cough drop if you would. And so she gave her a cough drop, and, you know, Kelly graded the papers and all of that kind of stuff. Favoritism at its height. But anyway, that was kind of there. But, um, but in Romans chapter 2, Paul said to the Romans, for God does not show favoritism. And as Christians, you and I are to treat people the same. It don't matter if they're Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, American, African, El Salvadorian, are y'all hearing me? Hispanic, whatever. We're to treat them the same. Rich people. Poor people, educated, uneducated, sophisticated, complicated, we are to treat them the same because they're made in the image of God, just like you and I. Now, if we're not careful, it's easier to treat people different if we have knowledge of those people. Uh, now, I want to give you some examples because you might be operating from a position, well, this person could do something for me. Well, if you're not careful, you'll be showing favoritism and prejudice. Let me give you an example. James gives us an example in chapter 2. First of all, I want you to understand that on the surface, we must look at everyone with intrinsic value. James says, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the person with, you know, the rich person, but then you say to the poor one, you stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Now, if you hadn't figured out, James don't mince no words. He's not trying to make it easy on his listeners. He could really care less. That's kind of the way Jesus was. And if you want about John the Baptist, he's, you know, you generation of broods and vipers who has warned you. You know what I mean? He, he, you didn't want John the Baptist as your pastor either. But obviously there will come a time when you have knowledge of someone. If you do ministry very long, you'll understand the frequent flyers. I don't even do benevolence ministries anymore because I got too calloused. It's like a guitar player. After a while, your fingers just get calloused and it don't hurt no more. It don't burn no more. It's that same way it is with your heart when you deal with certain kinds of situations over and over and over again. So I took myself out of it and say, we let some of the staff that still got some compassion left <laughs> because I could smell a drug deal a mile away or somebody's trying to get money for this or money for that. And I, you know, so here's the thing. When you gain certain knowledge of people, their character, their motives, their conduct, the way they carry out their lives, then you take that into consideration. That's just called knowledge. You have knowledge of how someone acts, their modus operandi. So you now know if you give them $20, they're going to get a crack rock. 
Is anybody with me? Say amen. amen. So these things you have to keep in, in your mind. But on that surface, we have to look at everybody with intrinsic value. And we have to look at everybody as valuable in the eyes of God and, and not show discrimination or else we have an evil motive according to the word. So we have to see them in the best light possible. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. I want you to know something. In time, their actions will prove whether they stand with the Lord, whether they stand with the church, and whether they stand with you. In, in time, their actions will always show you the truth. It don't matter what they say, their actions. Jesus said you will know a tree by the fruit that it bears. It doesn't matter. I could put, I could put orange tree, a tag that says this is an orange tree. If apples are growing on it, I submit to you that it is not an orange tree. It doesn't matter. That's almost like the news nowadays, but anyway. But if we discriminate against people, the Bible says we are guided by evil motives. Do you remember what Matthew said? It's a golden rule. Some of you could quote it. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Someone requoted that for me one day, or misquoted it, I should say. And they said, no, that said do unto others before they do unto you. No, that's not what it said. It said do unto other people just like you would want to be treated. If you want to be shown mercy if you messed up, then show somebody mercy. If you want to be given to if you're in need, then give to somebody when you have it. You know, if you want love, then give love. So, so it's important to know that genuine people live it out. They don't just talk it. James 2 and 8 says, Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the Scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing sin you are guilty of breaking the law. Now, why is this important to know this? It's important because hypocrites talk the talk. You hear me? Hypocrites talk the talk. But real Christians walk it out. They walk the walk. So, so talk is all they do. It reminds me of the Pharisees. Jesus said, you know the Pharisees. They have their long robes and they have their beads and their, their jewelry. And they love to be seen in the streets and in the city square. And they love to, to, to make long prayers and beautiful prayers. They have a beautiful game. But Jesus said, you are like unto whited sepulchers. You've washed the outside of the grave, but inside it's still nothing but dead men's bones. Amen? He said, You've cleaned the outside of the cup and the saucer, but inside is stained and ugly. What Jesus is saying for real Christians is we do more than just polish the outside of our life. We do more than just hang beautiful curtains and call it a Christian life. Through and through, inside and out, we love people from the depths of our heart. Well, so Matthew 6, Jesus says this, and when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they love to look miserable and disheveled. So people will admire them for their fasting. Uh, he said, you know, for they, they, he said, I'll tell you the truth, then they're going to get, that's the only reward they got. But when you fast, he said, comb your hair, wash your face, then nobody will notice that you're fasting except your Father in, your heaven, in heaven and your Father in heaven that sees what you do in private. He'll reward you. Matthew 6 and 5 says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who like to pray publicly and on the street corners and the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, that's the only roar they'll ever get. So if you're doing something to be seen of men, let me just say, let me just say you decide to give the church $100,000. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to take you out to eat. <laughs> but if you come down here and write me a check that's, you know, six foot long and two foot wide, and it says $100,000 got your name up. Man, we're going to bless you. Don't get me wrong. But Jesus said, that's all you got. He said, that's the, that, that applause of men, that's all you got is what they gave you. If you've done it with a motive of being seen by men. He said, now, if you've done that with the right heart, the Lord says, you'll have that reward and what I bless you with. Are you with me? Say amen. Now, we're open to that six foot by two foot check. However you see that. But anyway, uh, James chapter 2, he says, For whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy. 
So let me tell you a story to illustrate. Matthew tells a story, and I'm just going to start reading it, and then I'll paraphrase because I don't want to take all the time. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who wanted to settle accounts. This is Matthew 18 and uh, 23. He said he began to settle, and a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought in to him. And since he was not able to pay the debt, the master ordered that his wife and his children be sold to repay the debt. And uh, at this time, the servant fell on his knees and said, Please be patient with me. He begged, and I'll pay you back everything. So the servant's master took pity on him, and he just simply canceled the debt and let him go. That's awesome, isn't it? He said in verse 28, but that same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants that owed him only a hundred pieces of silver, hundred silver coins, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of what he owed his boss. He said, and he grabbed him around the throat and he began to choke him and he said, pay back everything you owe me. He demanded it. And the guy says to him, uh, you know, falling on his knees, he said, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. And, you know, I, I'm going to get it, but I don't have it right now. And he says, no, no, no. He refused. And he had the man thrown into prison. He said until he could pay the whole debt. He said when the other servants saw what this guy had done, they went back to their boss and they said, uh, told him what he'd done. He brought him in and said, listen, I canceled all of your debts because you begged me to do it. I showed you mercy. And now you have gone out and thrown the man in prison. He only owed you a fraction. He said, so I'm going to throw you in prison. Now I revoke my previous mercy ruling, and now I'm going to send you to prison. You'll be tortured, and you'll work like a dog until you pay it all back. So if you want to have mercy shown to you, show mercy to somebody else. That's what James said. So, so, so what is it, pastor, that you want me to do? See, because genuine Christians live it out. That's what we need to know. And why it's important is because it's hypocrites that just talk the talk. And you can identify them. All they do is talk. They got the loudest mouth in town. Don't do squat. You could, I know someone's running through your mind right now. Just don't, just hold it in. So what is it, pastor, that you want me to do? What's my action step? I want you to be real. I want you to be real. I want you to live out this life of faith. Don't just talk a good game to somebody. If you tell them you're going to pick them up at church, go get them. If you tell them you're going to take them out to eat, take them out to eat. If you tell them you'll go to life group with them, go. Be known as someone who lives a life of integrity. Your word is all that you've got. A man or a woman of faith and integrity, be that in a world where they are very rare. Very rare. Uh, are, are there people that actually do what they say they'll do? James says a lot about aligning your words and your walk. In fact, in verse 14 of chapter 2, he said it like this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say I have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Now, I, I want to, I want to um, stop for just a second because we talk about the finished work at Calvary and what Jesus did. Please understand, you can't earn your salvation. You can't work long enough, hard enough. You ain't got enough money to buy it. You don't have enough connections for it. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what Paul told the Ephesian believers. So that work is done. But what he's saying is once we've accepted Jesus Christ and he's come into our heart, it's not that we're trying to earn our way to heaven because we couldn't do it. We're going to want to do something for the one who res rescued us and redeemed us and saved us and lifted us out of the, the miry clay, put our feet upon a rock and established our goings. So what good is it, dear brothers, if you say you have faith but you do not have actions? Can faith save you alone? He says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or no clothing and you say, Y'all buckle your seatbelt. It's going to get a little strong here. Goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person anything, any food or any clothing. What good does that do? Hello? Now, I understand we live in a time where uh, it, it's tough, especially you drive through Jacksonville. You see people on every street light with a can and, and, and then we watch the news, and we know some of them are making thousands and thousands of dollars a month panhandling. 
That's where we have to be led by the Spirit. I can't tell you how many times I've passed them, but uh, just a couple of months ago, I passed one. I was coming out of Walmart, and the uh, Spirit of the Lord checked me and said, give him some money. I'd already passed him. Kelly said, what are you doing? I'm turning around. I'm going to work my way back through. I'm going to take, I don't remember if it was 10 or $20, but I handed it to him and said, God bless you. I hope you have a great day. And uh, so I, I did what I felt like the Lord would have me to do. Can you do every single one? I don't believe you can, but it's got to be led of the Lord. But he says, like, if we tell someone, oh, you're destitute, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you have nowhere to lay your head, well, we're praying for you, man. I don't know if they really want to serve our God. Whereas, like, right now, if they're hungry like yesterday, and we gave them a $60 meal, are you with me? Not just them, but 416 of them. That says, and, and you know, and, and I promise you in this room right now, you would go above and beyond that. If, if it was necessary and someone who was hurting, I know you. You would have reached deeper and done more. Uh, he said, but if you do that, if you do nothing, what good does it do? He, what, what James is saying, there's many people like clouds with no rain. Second Peter said it like this. These people are springs without water, mists that are driven by the storm. The blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they, uh, uh, for they uh, mouth empty, boastful words by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh. They entice people who are just escaping um, those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are the slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Ooh. Ooh, you are a slave to whatever has mastered you, whatever you can't say no to, whatever you can't set aside. So, uh, so that's what we need you to do. We need you to be real. We need you to live out your life of faith. And then why? Because if you're not real, then what are you? Fake. Huh? Y'all remember Coca-Cola? Um, it, it's still pretty popular. Coca-Cola back, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, come out with this crazy idea that they would mess up the original recipe and come out with what they call real Coke. Y'all remember that? Huh? And it tasted horrible. And the people had a backlash. They didn't like the real deal, the real Coke. And so they came back a few months later, once they started losing millions of dollars because people started drinking RC and Pepsi. Are y'all with me? They come back with the original taste and people bought back in. Listen, you can be fake or you can be real. I, I, I didn't say that you're perfect because we're not, but I'd rather you be real than be plastic, a put on, nothing but showmanship. You know, every time I see, oh, God bless you, my dear child. I mean, just everything is hunky-dory, and at night you cry yourself to sleep. I'd rather you just be real. Now, I know there's times where you ask me how I'm doing, and I've had some bad news, and i got to be real by faith. Anybody with me? How many ever, ever said, I'm okay, and you knew you were saying it by all the faith you could muster up because what you had just read at home or what you had just gone through, you really wasn't okay. But you knew God was going to help you get through it. And you knew you weren't going to throw your hands up and quit. There's a difference. So be real. Don't be a hypocrite. James said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. You see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces deeds. It is dead and useless. If I have a faith that don't produce, my faith is dead. I had the faith a number of years ago to say, we're coming out here, we're going to buy this land. And I, honest to God, I didn't know how we'd ever going to build anything because we paid $328,000 for the land at the height of real estate. I mean, I'm thinking, Lord, I don't know how in the world we'll ever do it, but I look back and I see the fruit of it. And then I, I look around and we're planning to do it again. Are y'all with me? What, what that is, that's fruit. God says, I'll honor a faith that puts their confidence in me. And then God, you know, God will just allow fruit to just begin to bloom on the tree. You just keep the faith. You just keep on believing God. You just keep holding on to the promise. You keep planting and you keep watering. And before you know it, the seasons will change and you'll be harvesting. So, 
I remember telling our staff numerous times during the pandemic, I said, we will not stop planting because the people ain't here. We're going to keep planting because if we don't plant right now, there will be no harvest to reach in six months or a year. I said, we're going to stay connected to the people. We're going to keep planting seeds. We're going to keep planting for the future. We're going to keep believing God, and, and the harvest will come. Now, let, let me move on. So if someone, uh, excuse me, now someone may argue, this is verse 18, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But James said, I say to you, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Verse 21, do you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right by his actions with God when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, that's a pretty big order right there. When, when you remember, because Isaac was the son of promise, and God had promised him for 25 years to Abraham, and now the boy was born, he's raised, he's 17 years old, and God speaks to Abram, and he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son of promise, Isaac, and I want you to take him on yonder mountain, Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him to God as a burnt offering on the mountain. Have you ever had it in your life when God didn't make sense? I could imagine Father Abraham said, God, no, you ain't making no sense. You promised him to me for 25 years. I, I, I did everything I could. I held on. I kept the faith. You come back to me in two or three different dreams and reiterated the dream to me. We even had uh, Ishmael. We thought that was the deal, and you said no, but it'll be the fruit of your own loins. And when I was 90, or my wife was 90, and I was 100, you gave me this son. What's the chances? something like that happened again. Now you want me to kill him. But he stood in faith. And the Bible said, he said to his wife, Sarah, I and the lad will go yonder and worship on that mountain. Watch this. Here's the faith. And I and the lad will return here. Now you wouldn't understand it if you only read Genesis but if you go back or if you go to the New Testament and read Hebrews, the Bible says that Abraham believed God. He staggered not at the promise of God, and he believed if he killed him on Mount Moriah, God would raise him from the dead. Faith and works. Abraham said, I have faith. I left Ur of the Chaldeans headed for, I don't know, to a place whose builder and maker was God. I left not knowing where I was going to go. She said, honey, where are we going to go? I don't know, but we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen. God's going to lead me out. Thank God for men and women that will still walk on in faith when they don't know where they're going. They don't see the answer. They don't have all the data. That's faith. And, and, and I know, you better know, because there's a fine line between faith and foolishness and stupidity. But he left, and he carries his boy up there, and he's about to kill him. And he's about to stab him with his knife, and you know he's tied down to this altar. And his old man looks up, tears streaming down his face, I'm sure, onto his beard. And he heard some baha and some, some, some carrying on in commotion. And he looked, and just in the distance, there was a ram caught by his horns in a thicket. And what I want you to know is while Abraham and Isaac walked up this side of the mountain in faith believing, God had a ram walking up the other side who was the provision for it. You know, and the Bible says that God, he was our ram. Are you with Jesus? Was that substitute for us that died for us? Us so that we didn't have to die. He has one time for all time laid his whole life down and forever sat down at the right hand of the Father. Faith without works is dead. You might not understand how you're going to do it, but you have to say, God has called me, and I am going to, op I'm going to operate in faith. I'm going to give in faith. I'm going to serve in faith. I'm going to walk in faith. Matter of fact, thank you, Holy Ghost. Anything that is of, not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. Matter of fact, he said, uh, faith is the substance of what we hope for, the evidence of what we don't yet see. That, that's Hebrews uh, 11 and 1. And then he says in 11 and 6, 
Uh, for it is impossible to please God without faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith. You got to have it. So, so how, do I, how, do I, how do you know I've got faith? Because I put legs on what I say. Are you with me? How do I know I have faith? Because we sat in the meeting and they said, oh, Pastor, uh, you really sure we're going to do 400 boxes? That's $24,000. And I kind of staggered a little bit too. But the more and more, something just kept pounding away in my mind. No, we said we're going to do it. We have proclaimed it. We have believed it. And if we don't, then we're saying God's not able to do it. So I said, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to push on. And uh, hey, I remember talking to someone because we got some wonderful donations. And then we run up in a bind with one, one situation. And I remember telling this brother, we're going to do them if we go to Walmart and buy it all ourselves, or Publix or wherever else. Doesn't matter, we're going to do it. You see, you got to have your mind set. When God says something, I'm going to serve God or bust. Doesn't matter. I, Lord, let me, let me try to tie this up. Um, you see, faith and actions, according to James about Abraham here, he said, verse 22, you see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. His actions made his faith complete. So, as it happened, just in the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So, you see, when we are shown to be right with God by what we do, did you, did you catch that? So, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by what we say. Everybody says, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to this church. I go to, that, that, don't, that don't impress me. Let me see your life. And how you walk it out. And that's what impresses me. Certificates and diplomas and all that, I done been around enough to know. I don't care if you graduated from Yale and Harvard. That's probably not even a good thing anymore. But anyway, that doesn't matter to me one iota. You might, not, you might have just a piece of paper that you got perfect attendance in kindergarten. But if you got a heart for Jesus, you got a heart to, that loves him and you're going to follow him till you die, that impresses me more than the paper on the wall. And I'm not against the paper on the wall. I got one. I'm not against that. That didn't change my, I had my faith in God before that. And I'll have my faith in God after that. Let me tie it up here. Um, James 2 and 25 says, Rahab the prostitute is another example. You know, he even used prostitutes. That's right. The Bible says Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right by her right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them out safely. Let me tell you what Rahab did. Rahab ran a house of ill repute. Now I know some of y'all are wondering, Caleb and Joshua, what in the world was they doing down at this house when they went to spy out the city? Well, first of all, in those days, it would not be uncommon, are you with me, for them to be there in those days. Uh, and in the, I'm not saying partaking of all the foolishness, but it would be a great way to sort of be in the crowd, mix and hide. But they talked to Rahab and said what they were doing, that they were on a mission from God. And she hid them up in the attic. She hid them, and when the enemy came, she went to the door and said, they went that way, and the whole time she knew they were up there. Now, I know that's some situational ethics right there because she lied. She did. She was lost anyway. <laughs> but the Bible tells me that they had a talk with her just a little bit before this and ask her to put a scarlet cord out the window. And, and they would know. And so when she showed them favor, the Bible tells us, watch the lineage of Jesus. You'll see it on the Christmas Eve service. How God took this woman and brought her into the kingdom of God. No matter what, she was this prostitute and ran the house of ill repute. But when she came face to face 
with the gospel with these guys. She gave her heart to the Lord, and the Bible said her house was saved. Her house was saved. So, so here's what it said. She was, shown the right to, she was shown to be right with her God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them out safely by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so faith is dead without works. Now, Jesus is preaching to a crowd one day, and I'm going to land it right here. Jesus is preaching to a crowd one day, and basically in my vernacular, he's telling them, you got to live out this Christian life. You can't just talk. You got to live it out. And, and, and I've paraphrased that for you. I believe he's saying to them in this place, emulate what I have modeled before you for these three years. And here's what he said to them as you stand with me. Now, I want you to get this because this right here is going to be a little bit tough. It's going to be a little strong, stronger than coffee. So Jesus looks at his people, and I believe, like I said, he's saying, I want you to emulate what you've seen me do. And here's what he said. Love your enemies. Do good to them or those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. We had a worker in Camden yesterday that did get cussed out because they didn't give away two boxes to the car. We only was given one per, per family, but we say, God bless you and be blessed anyway. He says, bless those that curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek. Also, if someone demands your coat, Offer him your shirt also. Give to anyone that asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you only love those that love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, and why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to others for a full return. He said, but love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be great and you will be truly acting as the children of the Most High, for He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. That's some tall orders right there. I told my youngest son one day to turn the other cheek. I said, that's what Jesus said. He said, Daddy, I ain't got but two. This side nut. And it's easy for us to get caught up in the emotion and do our own thing. And it's easy for us to buddy and show favoritism and partiality to those that we love and the ones we run with and the narrative that we believe. But to try to put everybody on level ground and say, I'm going to give credence to your story and I'm going to hear it. I'm going to give credence to your story and I'm going to hear it. And then I'll make a decision once I've been informed completely. In fact, the word says a wise man hears the whole matter and don't speak until he does. I tell married couples all the time because I have one call me and maybe he will tell me how bad his wife is. And, you know, it's just, just horrible situation. And I have long, long since learned to reserve any words, only to say, you have your story, she has her story, and then there's God's story. He knows exactly what the truth is. And it does usually lie somewhere in the middle. Amen? But what I want to challenge you to do today is live a real life. I'm not saying that you've been a hypocrite, only you know the answer to that. But to live out a real life...
before your family, before your church, your community, that people look at you and they, they'll go back and say, when this man says something, you can take it to the bank because he lives by what he said. He ain't going to say something and then back up. He's not going to say something and then do something totally. That is not his or her character. And when you're known like that, I'd rather, a good name is better to be chosen than riches and rubies. Amen. So I, I could have just named this message, Keep It Real. I wonder if you're here with me today and you say, Pastor, I'm going to keep it real. I'm, I'm going to be the real deal. I'm not, I, I want you to pay attention to this now. Don't say and boast about things that you know you have no plan to do. <laughs> That's why I'm be real. Bow with me if you would. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you right now, would you touch us and help us to be real with you? Help us to be real with you, Lord, and I just want to pray if there's anyone here right now that, that is not real with you, that they will take this moment to be very transparent and very real. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Saints, I want you to pray for me because I've not been that real, genuine person like I should be with the Lord. I, I've been more to the other side of that, but right now, I know better now, so I'm going to do better right now. I'm going to put my heart in His hands, and from this day forward, I'm going to be real. Can I see your hand? He said, God bless you. Thank you for your quick response. You too. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Three, four hands. Thank God. Be real with the Lord. Father, I thank you for these that said that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be real with you, Lord. It ain't going to be just a talk. It's not going to be just the name of a church that says I'm affiliated with this place, but it's going to be a relationship with God. My life is going to be different. There's going to be fruit on the limbs of this tree, people are going to know me by the fruit that I bear. 